Hey everyone, it's James. Welcome to Manic Monday here on Digital Charcuterie, a show we do on Mondays. We just talk a variety of topics and hopefully uh, you enjoy what you hear. Got to give a big thank you to all the recent subscribers. Uh, it's really been fantastic uh, to see. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, we now have a membership you can join if you're interested in that, but it's been great. We've, we've This is our biggest month we've had. Uh, since starting this and it just keeps going up and we're having a lot of fun this channel is primarily discussions we like to do a lot of discussions and you know so we're gonna have guests on here and talking and uh it's, it's just a lot of fun and i can't wait to have more of these talks with you and i want you guys to join in on the conversation as well today though it's just kind of a news brief it's like hey here's what happened in the world over the weekend uh so we're going to talk some star wars some deadpool 3 and um some Batman because the Batman's uh, about to hit half a billion dollars. It's kind of a big deal. People are really liking that movie. So let's just get right into it. We're going to start off with Ray. Everyone loves Ray. Well, most people love Ray. Daisy Ridley gave the YouTubers and Twitterers and TikTokers a soundbite for the ages at the British Academy Film Awards. A reporter asked her if she'd be returning to Ray, and she said she will always be Ray. Something that, of course, caught the attention of everybody. And Daisy Ridley found herself trending within seconds. But is she playing with us or is there more to this story? Let's look into this on this Manic Monday. A few months ago, a former Vanity Fair reporter said on the Ringer podcast that she had heard Lucasfilm had an idea for Ray. The reporter then clarified that you could fill an entire stadium with the ideas at Lucasfilm. Don't get overly excited by that idea. They have plenty of ideas to work from. But, but what if they are actively pursuing this Ray story? And what if the Ray storyline, the Disney Plus show, the trilogy, whatever it is meant to be, actually has connections to the upcoming Obi-Wan Kenobi show. In Obi-Wan Kenobi, and this is all stuff we've heard, all rumors, take it with a grain of salt, of course, but in the Obi-Wan Kenobi show, Obi-Wan Kenobi cannot see or hear Qui-Gon. However, over the course of the series, he is able to first hear him, and then he is able to see his former master. Now maybe, this is, again, this is a stretch, but bear with me here, because this could be a thing, but maybe this is the aspect that connects to the Rey show. Maybe it connects directly to Rey and Ben Solo. Let's think about it this way. What if after the sequel trilogy, it's all come and gone, she walks into the sunset, blah blah blah, she, Rey Skywalker, we all know how it goes. She starts up a new Jedi Order. She starts training younglings. Things are going well. I mean, you know, as well as they go in Star Wars. Things are going well. And all of a sudden she hears something, but she doesn't understand it or know who it is. She recognizes it, but can't quite recognize it. It's not exactly familiar to her. The voices keep coming, and eventually she realizes that it's the voice of Ben Solo. But soon she realizes that the voice isn't being sent through the Force, but something else entirely. It's not Ben Solo's voice being sent to her through the Force. There's something more cosmic at hand here. And so, Rey leaves her younglings behind, possibly in the hands of another Jedi master. Who knows, she might not be alone. And she sets out on a quest in search of Ben Solo, in search of this voice. Disney never truly committed on Rey and Ben. The fans, however, on social media have been very, very vocal and money talks. I think it would be a wise move financially for these two former foes to meet once again across the stars. So what do you guys think? Was Daisy Ridley just having fun? Or will she be returning as Rey sooner than later? Now let's move right along to one of my favorite characters in the Marvel Universe comics and otherwise the Incredible Hulk. I grew up with the Incredible Hulk. He's one of my favorite characters, Spider-Man bar none, but Incredible Hulk is right up there. And Mark Ruffalo just, he has embraced this character. He'll do anything he wants for it. But is he going to be in Deadpool 3? I doubt it, but we're going to talk a little bit about that because there's been a director announcement on Deadpool 3. Deadpool is entering the MCU with the Adam Project Sean Levy slated to direct. The third film in the fourth wall-breaking film will no doubt be a massive hit. The biggest change, aside from director, is the character's entry into the MCU. It's currently rumored that the character will make his MCU debut in the post credit scene for Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, a scene that would see Deadpool, Cable, and Domino looking over the dead bodies of the Illuminati and making a joke about Professor X dying for a third time. Curious if Levy in fact directed this end credit scene, my guess is, if this scene is true, that he did not direct it. 
But what about the Hulk? Well, Levy and Reynolds both worked together on Free Guy and then The Atom Project, and maybe they're bringing more people from The Atom Project over to Deadpool 3. And of course, Mark Ruffalo is in The Atom Project, if you haven't seen it, spoilers, but Mark Ruffalo plays Reynolds' father. In the past, of course. And Ruffalo seems to pop up wherever in the MCU he wants, or wherever he is needed, and he never seems to have an issue with doing so. He's just like, he's like, yeah, sign the paycheck and I'll be there. I don't think they tell him half the time because, you know, him and spoilers, they go hand in hand. So I'm sure if Levy and Reynolds both asked, or even one of them asked, he would be all in on appearing in Deadpool 3. But wait, there's more. What about Jennifer Garner? Jennifer Garner, of course, is also in The Adam Project. And spoilers, if you've seen the trailer, you know, she plays the mom, Mark Ruffalo's wife. But Jennifer Garner is no stranger to superheroes. She played Elektra, of course, in Daredevil and Elektra. Now, she is far removed from that character in that time. Ben Affleck obviously turned down coming back as Daredevil in the Multiverse of Madness, though he potentially may still return. But Jennifer Garner, however, that could be something fun to have her play in Deadpool 3, and Deadpool could even say something along the lines of, oh, hi, mom. And then there's just Gamora, also, because, uh, you know, she's in Adam Project as well. And you know, everybody in the Adam Project should just show up in Deadpool 3. I would be all gung-ho for that, but what do you guys think? Do you like the idea of Hulk or even Elektra appearing in Deadpool 3? Or are you saying, no, leave well enough alone, leave that stuff to the multiverse of madness and let Deadpool be Deadpool? Three hours is not enough screen time to keep people away from seeing the Batman at the theater. People are saying, oh, it's too long and this and that. It's too dark. It's too moody. It's emo. It's this and that. And yet here is this movie making half a billion dollars sometime this week anyway. The movie crushed at the weekend box office and it's it looks like it's, it's not going to be slowing down any time soon. This movie is massive it is bigger than i think warner brothers had anticipated although i don't know why everyone seems surprised when batman does well but let's be real here batman is one of the biggest icons the most known superheroes of all time you give people a good batman movie and they will flock to the theater you give people a good spider-man movie they'll flock to the theater you give people a bad batman theater it'll still break a hundred million dollars in the 90s that's just how it works people love these characters. The Batman in its second weekend dropped only 51%, which is pretty phenomenal for a movie. If you compare it to other Batman movies, Batman v Superman was a 69% drop. The Dark Knight Rises was 61 Justice League was only 56%, but that one made no money opening weekend, so really, you know, that's nothing. And The Dark Knight was only 53%, so this is right around the Dark Knight numbers, which makes sense because they're both being heralded as the best Batman movies of all time, and it would make sense that their droppings would be very similar to one another. So the movie earned $66 million in its second weekend in the North American box office, bringing its grand total, domestic total, I should say, to $238.5 million. But the movie just passed $400 million worldwide, I should say. So not just overseas, everything combined. $400 million. It's projected to pass $500 million sometime this week, which would bring it to half a billion dollars in just a week and a half. Well, we'll call it two weeks because of the, the advanced showings and previews and whatnot, which raked in a lot of money. So let's call it two weeks. It's making half a billion dollars. IMAX drove 26% of it. So people are seeing this on the big screen. They want to see it on the big screen. They want to experience the sound in the IMAX cinemas. This is how you watch movies, and this could be the future of movies. The movie, of course, is going to go nowhere near where Spider-Man No Way Home was domestically and probably internationally as well. That movie's still making money, despite being leaked and being released March 15th digitally. Spider-Man No Way Home earned $792.2 million after 13 weekend, taking $4 million this weekend. A drop of only 11%, which is not much, but it's still in 2,702 locations. This is, this is what I love about the box office right now, is that there's no rush to go see these movies, and this is the concern with the Batman, and maybe Warner Brothers, once again, is making a mistake with their release schedule on HBO Max. It's coming out April 19th on H HBO Max. So people who want to see it in the theater two weeks now, they're seeing it in the theater. Worldwide, maybe not. 
maybe not. Maybe they're going to keep going and driving it, but, but the numbers aren't the same over there. They're not as massive as they are here. You have to look at the whole world compared to just North America and in North. Well, and in the USA, it's coming to HBO Max in uh, like in what, 30 days now, less than 30 days from now. So that's that's going to be the intriguing thing is how it's going to keep holding up with that date looming. And not everybody might know that yet, but that information is going to get out there and people are going to figure it out. So are they going to keep going to the theater to watch this movie? Again, though, when you look at the IMAX numbers, you're thinking, oh, maybe they do. Maybe this is a movie that people are understanding that it's a better experience theatrically. Much like Spider-Man. Spider-Man theatrically. The first time you see Spider-Man No Way Home in the theater. That opening night. When, I mean, we all knew what was coming, but when it came. Right? There was an explosion. When Matt Murdock comes on the screen. There's an explosion. You get those experiences from the theater, and people are, I think, you know, after a few years of being away from that, people are starting to come back and realizing the value that they have. So maybe HBO Max doesn't take away from it, but maybe it does. We don't, we don't know. Time will tell. That is it for Manic Monday here on Digital Charcuterie. If you have a topic you would like to hear us discuss, email us at digitalcharcuterie at gmail.com. We read them all. We love them all. We appreciate it. Thank you all so very much. We hope you have a great week, and until next time, may you be the master of your own universe.